Nehemiah chapter 4, I'm going to go back, but I do want to start with this. Uh, Nate, if you didn't find it, I'm going to come back to it eventually, but I want to speak to you uh, about this scripture, and then I'm going to go back and then forward. In Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says when, uh, I'm sorry, starting in verse 1, it says when Sambalot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, everyone say rebuilding the wall. He became angry and was greatly incensed. This guy is not for the Israelites. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? I want you to pause right there because this next thing that I put on there is when the seed of salvation is planted in broken ground, restoration begins. I'm coming from a place of brokenness where God restored me in a heap of rubble. There was nothing in my life that made sense 20 years ago. Nothing. The only thing that made sense to me was that I was sitting in a pile of depression or addiction that... And I'm trying to put stuff together. And the way that I see this in my mind is uh, Becky loves to do puzzles. I hate puzzles. It's a complete opposite. Like if I did a puzzle worth with her at our house, it would be a point of contention in our home. Because I stand up and I'm like, this could go anywhere. But she loves it. And in my reasoning, the reason I'm more frustrated, because somewhere in life someone saw a perfect picture, said let's smash this into a thousand pieces, and then put it back together. Someone thought it was a good idea, and they, and they do this. But I don't have the patience for it. Becky does. If you want to do a puzzle, have Becky help you, not me. God has the peace and the patience and the wisdom and the experience to help you when you're trying to put things and you're trying to make sense out of whatever it is that you're going through. Like I said, I'm going to end up there in just a moment, but I want us for a moment to get a full scope of when God moves in your behalf. There are so many factors that go into your life as a direct result as his activity. Nathan, you can go back to the beginning if you can, get to that first graph that I have. And what we see here in just a moment, what I've got, I put this up here so you can take a picture with your cell phone or if you want to, you can go look at this later on. Let me explain what this is, is that um, what we see here is a chronological order of the scriptures. So when you get into your scriptures, what you read typically is you got the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law, those are the books of Moses. Then you have the books of history, and then you have the books of literature or poetry, and then you've got the prophetic books. It's not chronological. So right here on the left, you've got the dates, then you've got the event and scriptures that will go with that, then you've got the books, and then you've got the empire, and then you have the overlap. What that means is like how they are intertwined, and where I want us to focus are not just in the the events that happened, but the people and what they did during these times. So what you see over here, for example, is if you were to read the book chronologically, the Bible chronologically, you would have Ezra up here. Ezra, read it to chapter 6, put in that whole book of Esther there. Isn't that incredible? Like when Ezra is rebuilding the foundation of the temple and the altar, and they get that completed... All of a sudden, there is an assault to annihilate the Jewish people. And then Esther comes into play. Esther comes in, and she's appealing on a higher level. Who can get to the heart of a king better than his woman, right? He had his mind determined, right? And God positioned Esther in a high position. So he's in the high places and the low places at your life. He's already moving on your behalf. I believe in this thing that we've got going for the school. He's already got people that have started things, and we're just going to walk into into a blessing. We're going to walk into authority because he's the ultimate authority. I'm not appealing to a judge. I'm not appealing to people. I'm appealing to the Lord in prayer. The minute Melissa and Shana actually brought to this to me, I couldn't sleep over this thing. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, there's an issue at the high school, and they're letting three kids take the fall for something that should not be happening. They're letting rumors be spread about these kids that they acted in violence when they did not. I spoke directly to the mom. I spoke directly to the principal. And I'm telling you, what's going on there is not right. And so this is more than just kids, though. This is about a foundational truth to life. So picking back up where we were, I I don't want to get too sidetracked with that because I sometimes just pray and think about this a lot is that situation. So keep that in prayer. Keep that situation in the schools with your prayers. So 
Ezra 6, then Esther comes into play, and then you finish up Ezra, and then, let's say, Nehemiah picks up after that about 13 years or so after Ezra. And you can actually read later on in Nehemiah that Ezra reads the book of the law and the people weep. And guess what's before this? If you took all this chronologically, you would actually put it back after Daniel and probably one of the prophets, a few of the prophets, because Daniel was in Babylonian captivity. So it's not like Ezra was the forerunner. It's not like, uh, it's not like Nehemiah or Esther were the forerunner. You can go back from the moment of when Babylon, Babylon took over Jerusalem and laid waste to it, and God still had his 17-year-old Daniel uh, telling the king, I am not going to compromise my integrity for you. When he resolved not to defile himself with certain foods, remember I preached on this? He didn't give momentum to Babylon. And now these people, Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah, are in the wake of that decision. You can make a decision today to not defile your family or defile yourself or defile your friendship or to defile your relationship. And you live in the wake of the blessing of that because God's blessings endure from generation to generation to generation. His blessings be upon you, right? So get the full scope of what's happening. And what I love about scriptures is that just in this moment, what I wanted to give you was just an idea when I bring these names up that you can, in your mind, like kind of connect with the story of what I'm telling you. But whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, we see people sharing these incredible statements or stories about a revelation or a realization that God had never abandoned them in the process. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, a man named Joseph, we all pretty much know this scripture, right? If you don't know, he had favor with almost anybody that's in authority. Isn't that pretty cool? That's a sermon unto itself. But he started out in his father's home, got a really nasty, ugly-looking, multicolored jacket, I think. That's the way I see it, because I I saw some weird movie that Becky liked back in the day. I'm like, ugh, I want to wear that thing around town. But it was a thing of prestige, and he got favor from his dad. His brother sold him into slavery. He uh, got so he would was picked up in Potiphar's home, got favor there. Then he went to jail, got favor with the jailer. And then he got favor with Pharaoh. And all of a sudden, all these highs and lows throughout Joseph's life, he he ends up confronting his brothers. This is if you don't know the story. The brothers that sold him into slavery came back because there was a famine. And there's no way Joseph during these times could have known what God was doing. He could have fluctuated with the emotion in the heart of it, saying, why, God, why am I going through this? But listen to this statement in Genesis 50, 20, when his brothers were afraid that he was going to about, you know, kill off him, them and their families. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now. Everyone say now. There's no way he knew until that point, that revelation hit him, that I get it now, God. I went through what I went through. So you might get the glory. I went through what I went through so that way generations might be preserved. I went through what I went through and I endured what I endured and I didn't lose sight of you. I praised you. I worshipped you. I questioned things at times. I went through real hard times. False accusations, kind of like what these boys are going through at the high school. But you know what? I look back now and I see what is now being done. The saving of many lives. That's an Old Testament example. Listen to the New Testament example in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Paul writes, And we know that God works for those who love God. All things work together, right? All things work together. Everyone say all things. All things, whether the good times or the trying times. All things work for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. We know that God works for the deliverance for the salvation and for the protection and the provision of those that love him. So what is your participation today? Whether it's Daniel, Esther's participation, Ezra's or Nehemiah's. What is your participation today that is going to impact and influence the upcoming generation? So using this imagery in Ezra and Nehemiah and uh, Esther, but I'm going to mainly reference uh, Ezra and mainly Nehemiah today. I, I want to look at also what, they're, what they were accomplishing in this time. So in the framework, kind of use it as a schematic for your personal life. Whether we're trying to restore confidence, whether we we're trying to restore our life with God, whether we're trying to restore relationship, a belief, whatever it is in your life that you're trying to restore, this is a great way for you to kind of look and say, what area am I in in life right now? 
because uh, you can go to the next, the next one, Nathan. Uh, when we look at the framework of how the Israelites rebuilt, this was the beginning point, was the altar. They didn't begin with the foundation. They didn't try building a structure without a foundation. And they didn't build a wall around nothing, right? It began with the altar. And very specifically, this altar wasn't just about sacrifices. This was an altar of worship. This was about making worship the forerunner. If we got to rebuild a wall in a temple, why not sing some songs while doing it, right? If I got to rebuild my life, why not praise the Lord while doing it? If I'm trying to engage this person who's given me hassle and I want to restore this relationship, why not sing praises of the, uh, to God while doing it? So the altar is the beginning point, but it's also the ending point. It's where we come to the end of ourselves at times and say, I've had enough of just trying to be right. I just want to make it right. There's a beginning and an ending at the altar. So the foundation, I'm going to go through this really quick because I don't want to stay here. The foundation is what's called the standard. This is the most critical point of any structure. So the, uh, the foundation for us, the measuring point, is the word of God. This is the standard. When I measure my relationships, or when, I, when Becky and I use this for the, for the college ministry, and I mentioned it to the youth, when we're laying the foundation of our home, there's a standard, a unit of measurement by which we see how in sync we are and what it is that we are going to instill into our kids and into our marriage. And this word of God, the word of God is the foundation. It is the standard. It's the most critical point of any structure. And then after this, number three, we see the temple. This is the order by, by which they were rebuilding. The temple is the place that the presence would dwell. This is the heart. And then the wall, this is protecting the center. So once again, I just don't want to focus on the process, but I want to focus on the people that were involved. And those three players, Ezra, Ezra Esther, and Nehemiah, they worked together. And in the age of information, in this braggadocious, egocentric culture, we know what the, the smallest things people are doing. Brace yourself. I found out the other day celebrities were walking on the beach holding hands. That was, that was the thing. I have not been the same since then. <laughs> That's what we're not, we're not walking in Tahiti holding hands. That's what we're missing. That's what constitutes as news and entertainment. What I'm telling you is there's no way that all these guys could have really known simultaneously what God was doing back in that culture. But God was preparing every single one of them. When God is speaking to you to build, he's been prepping someone for habitation. When he's speaking for you to repent, he's of something, I'm not saying repent of sin, but just repent of maybe even a, a unforgiveness. He's preparing someone else to receive restoration and forgiveness. When he's telling you to build, he's been prepping for someone else. Paul understood this perfectly when he says, one plants, one waters, but God makes it grow. That means growth is in the Lord's hands, right? How quickly should someone grow up? It's in the Lord's hands. So the title that I have for you today is Restoration in the Rubble. And this is coming from that seed of broken ground where I had no hope in my life. I had all the things wrong. And as I'm sitting in this, this rubble in my life, I'm wondering, how do I put things together? And I'm telling you, I couldn't do it. I kept diving further and further into confusion and when I'm sitting there in this moment of confusion, God speaks for me to, to turn to his word about something. And all of a sudden, he starts building my life for me. Restoration is about an act of restoring the condition of being restored, such as a bringing back to a former position or condition, reinstatement. And this is one here I just want to focus on for a second. This is the restoration of peace. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Can I get you to just kind of entertain me for a sec? I want you to go in your mind to the place in your, in your life sometime when you had the most true peace. Place yourself and your heart there. Even in this moment, in the whirlwind of chaos, you were in the eye of the storm. And if you cannot say, this is the day, 
I'm sitting here today, and despite all the stuff that's going on with my family, my, my work, or any of this other stuff, I can say that I still got this peace. So I'm asking you, if that's not you coming into this place today, what has caused the lack of confidence? Wars and rumors of wars could have done that, right? They're all around, right? Social media's constant barrage of negativity. It is constant transgender bathroom issues and the voices for, in my life that all surround those issues. And I'm going to tell you that even though the waters may spill over into the boat that you're in and the waves might be rising, there is one that calms the storm with a word, peace. Be still, is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9. Peace be still. And he rebuked the wind and the waves, not because he was fearful, but because he noticed what was happening in the, in the ranks. He noticed that they were fearful. They may, I think they yelled, Rabbi, aren't you even concerned? We might die. And so he didn't rebuke them yet. He first rebuked the situation and the circumstance, calmed them. Then he turned to the disciples and he says, why are you so afraid? Why have you so little faith? When was the last time you had the most peace? Because if you asked the disciples in that moment, you know what they probably would have said? When I was on dry ground, when I wasn't in this boat, when I was at home, when I was in my bed, when I was with my family and my kids, they were spinning their dreidels everywhere and my wife was burning the fresh trout that I got tangled up in the net. I had to work really hard to get it out. But I mean, it was chaotic, but at least I had balance. At least I wasn't in this situation. At least I wasn't over here. See, when peace gets interrupted, we get unnerved, we get uneasy, we get unsettled, and we begin to make decisions in regard to building our lives and relationships off of uncertainty, uncertainty and indecision. But I'm going to tell you that the stability of your peace isn't depending on the boat you're in or the land you're standing on or how high the waves are. Peace comes when Jesus speak, is able to speak into your spirit, and into your heart. So I, enc I encourage you today, if you're standing at the, at, the, at the, if you're in the rubble, if you are in whatever situation and you're wondering what efforts should I put into this, I'm imploring you to build with faith, to build with belief. What you see as rubble, God sees as redeemable. That's spoken from someone that knows what it's like to be completely broken and to have a God not just look at my mess and point an accusatory finger and say, well, if you didn't make that decision, you wouldn't be here. If you didn't drink that, you wouldn't have done that and you wouldn't be here. If you didn't have that job and you didn't do that and you didn't lie about that, you wouldn't be here. He didn't come into my situation and say, well, you know you grew up in a Nazarene church, so you kind of know better. I know that it's in there, right? No, he didn't come with me and I didn't feel that condemnation. When I was sitting in the midst of the rubble and the destruction, Jesus, the presence of God, came and he sat with me. And you know what he did? He directed my heart to a scripture that I, was, that I had issues with. And I wasn't even reading the Bible at the time. He put in my heart to see what the Bible said about a certain situation, about lust to be specific. And guess what happened? It becomes part of the foundation, but I had to get to the altar first. I saw that what God was teaching me was good and pleasing and perfect, and I had no idea how to start. What's the beginning point? So the third definition of restoration, this is the one I want us to absorb. You're fine, Nate, keep there. Is a restoring to an unimpaired or, in, or an improved condition. Now remember, I want to talk about the wall. I might not get there till next week because I'm setting the foundation for where I want to go. A restoring to an unimpaired or an improved condition. In order to find rest, we must begin the process of restoration. Do not fall into the deceit that you're too old to build or begin again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 4 says, Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Amen. That's, that's good. I want, you, I want you to know that the process begins at the altar. Psalm 51, uh, verse 17. This is King David writing. This is actually coming out of a place of repentance for him. And listen to what he says. He says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. Dave, King David was a wealthy man, right? He could have offered multitudes of gold, silver, linen, incense, sacrifices, Women, children, whatever he wanted. He could have sacrificed anything he wanted in an abundance. And he goes to God Almighty. 
The same God who says that these people praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he doesn't offer any of that material things because he knows that God wants the sincerity of your heart, of his heart. He's saying, my sacrifice, oh God, is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart you, God, will not despise. As a parent, I've kind of learned the difference between my kids' different wines. You know, you got the wine that wants attention, the wine that's obnoxious and not necessary, and then you got the sincere wine that's usually the cry. And there's times, like, where I hear the wine and the cry, and seriously, it's like, calm down, you're fine. Like, just get over it. And then you realize they really are bleeding. You're like, I was wrong on that one, but it's fine. (laughs) I've, I've missed the mark recently with Dawson, but that's okay. So... But then what I've realized is he's really exaggerated. You know, he exaggerates a lot. And we're all guilty of this in some fashion. We take a small offense and we all of a sudden blow it up, right? We take a small small inaccuracy, a small fault of our own. And what do we do? We blow it up so everybody sees it, right? But what God hears is the sincerity of your heart. What I learned is when I find out that the cry is sincere, you lift them up and you embrace them, don't you? When your kids come to you and they are broken, you don't turn them away. I don't care what they've gone through, right? I don't care where they've been. I don't care what decisions. When they're broken and they come to you, your heart is stirred. And David recognizes that this begins. This is the altar right here. I don't have to have something fancy to lay at the altar. What God wants is he wants my surrender. He wants to come and commune with me and restore me where I'm broken. And the evidence is that when you go to God, what David just wrote, is the evidence is that when you go to God in a state of brokenness, you're going to give yourself over into the hands of repair. So if I want to build, I want a solid foundation, I'm going to encase what it is, what's important to me and my family. But I want to talk to you about how the building of the wall began before we get into just that last portion of that scripture. This began with Nehemiah's burden in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah's brother and some men came from Judah to Susa where he was. And keep in mind at this time, Ezra has already built the altar, the foundation, and the temple. So this is already going on. Nehemiah's brother and some men came uh, from Judah to Susa where he was. And Nehemiah, he has this burden. He asked about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile. And listen to the report that they give him. They told him that the Jewish people were back in the province and were in great trouble and disgrace. Isn't that interesting? They didn't tell him, hey, we're making progress. There's a lot of stuff happening that's very good. The people are back, but the foundation's built, the temple's built. No, these people had a lens of negativity. In verse 3, they said, the wall of Jerusalem is broken and down, and its gates have been burned with fire. So sometimes we're going to get news of something by the lens by which someone else views it is hopeless. And I'm telling you, you use that lens to speak hope. You use that lens that they have to speak hope into the situation. The lens that places the burden on the heart of someone that is going to do something about it. That's what's awesome about this is that when it comes to Nehemiah, he doesn't just sit there and talk about it and weep about it. They brought it to someone that was a man of action, not just reaction. Verse 4 says, when I heard these things. Everyone say, when I heard these things. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And what you're going to see here is Nehemiah is characterized by this. For some days I mourned and fasted, but right here, and prayed before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah then brings this burden to the king, to whom he is cupbearer. Nehemiah's cupbearer at the time of the king is Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes' father would be King Xerxes. King Xerxes was married to Esther. Isn't that cool? Nehemiah already had favor before he went before the king. Artaxerxes was raised in the home of the man who was married to Esther. Isn't that insane? Isn't that awesome? So when we get this full scope of things, we see God was already working the restoration. God was already working restoration on your behalf. He's already started in the repair work. We have got to make sure that when we walk into church, to hear me here, If you came to me in my situation 20 years ago and you told me something I already didn't know about, that I was already problematic, that I had a lot of issues, it wouldn't have been help to me. You're not going to help me build. You know what helped? Compassion. Love. Yes, at times telling me that I was wrong. That absolutely helped, even though I didn't receive that. 
But Nehemiah says, when I heard these things, so I ask you, church, what stirs your spirit to action, not just reaction? What stirs you to do something? Because we're all capable of reaction, every one of us. But what spurs us to action? I'm not just going to suggest that action is that the action that stirs you is just or unjust, but remember that the answer to that question is an indicator as to what is stored up in your heart and what it is that you're trying to protect. When we look at Nehemiah, we see this man. I want to talk about the man really briefly. So he's a cupbearer to the king. He had connections. Like I'm cupbearer to King James, Pastor Jim. He's got connections, and when I need them, I'm going to use them, right? So I've got connections, I'm going to use them. So Nehemiah's cupbearer to the king, he has connections. He's a builder. He didn't just build, he also worked with the people. He was a delegator. Think about like a contractor, so to speak. So not only did Nehemiah show up when he gets to the wall, he doesn't say, wow, this is way too much for us. He didn't show up and say, I can do this all by myself. It'll take a few thousand years. What, what you see him do is he starts to delegate responsibility to those that had giftings. And those that had giftings were willing and had a passion and a desire to help Nehemiah build because they recognized that without the wall, the city is vulnerable to attack. That's why we have certain things in our church. That's why we've got certain ushers that we can trust, that have background checks, kids ministry workers, other people up here on the worship team that have shown and proven themselves to have a burden for the building. Amen? Amen. Come on, guys. I want to hear you. God places people in their giftings in order to bring him glory, not us. You know, I love Pastor Jim. I know he's watching and he says he wants me to be the quote-unquote hero with this thing. I want Jesus to be glorified. This is, if it's not about Jesus, then I don't want to be involved. I'm just going to be in some legalities that are just over and beyond me. I don't know that jargon. I don't care that much about it. But I tell you that there's a violation to basic fundamental truth that is scriptural. That's where the assault is. We've got to remember that the enemy cares about what this word says, not about what the bathroom say. Right? God made them male and female. And I'm not saying that to condemn or persecute anybody. This hits close to home for for Becky and myself. But what I recognize is that those that are encouraging these things, those that are celebrating these things, they might be showing on whatever platform we watch them, whatever social media, that this is the good life. But I promise you, without Jesus, they don't know peace. That they are in rubble. And what they need, first of all, is us to be people of prayerful reaction. So then we move into faithful action. This is the next point, is that Nehemiah was a man of continual prayer. He was always interceding for the people. When the insults came, what did he do? Did he say, oh, did you hear what they said? I can't do it. Oh, I'm afraid. And then did he abandon people because there was a lot of opposition? Listen to what he does. In Nehemiah 6, 9, this is a great example. If you read through Nehemiah, you see he hears something and he turns it to the Lord. They were all trying to frighten us. This is Nehemiah 6, 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too tired and weak for the work and it will not be completed. You know what he didn't do? He didn't go out there and say, um, I heard you were saying that our hands are too weak. Why do you think this? Are you seeing something? He didn't go out and engage them. About a year ago or so, I preached on engaging fruitless battles. Why? Because that's just one of those veins that just would have completely taken time and energy away from the greater task at hand. And when you're trying to be restored or to restore something, you're going to get people on the outside saying, what's the point? Why, do you not remember what they did or said to you? Do you not know where they are right now? Do you not know what they did last weekend? You're going to get people that are going to try to come against the conviction of the wall that God has told you to build. And the minute we start communicating with them, it's going to be like even the serpent. All of a sudden, their ideas become really good. And all of a sudden, you're right. I am justified in me being upset. Come to the altar first. Listen to the voice of the Lord. Where, why are you there? What is the purpose of this? And then when you start to build, you're going to have people up in, in uh opposition to what it is at times but listen to what he said but I prayed everyone say but I prayed now strengthen my hands that was his prayer I need to encourage you guys stop going to people that give bad advice if someone on repeat in my life has told me that something was going to happen and it didn't happen I'd shut it off I'm not giving you my attention 
If someone on repeat is telling me that, um, let's say, for example, um, several years ago, there was a burden that I had to restore a relationship, despite the amount of advantage that I was taken of, that's bad advice. Because I knew what God had put in my heart to do. If someone is going to you and, and they want to complain more than praise, that's contradictive to Scripture. Spiritual talking heads abound. There's a lot of people that are doing the things in the name of the Lord, and I don't want to be one of those people. You've got to make sure what they're speaking to you adds up to Scripture. That's got to where it's got to align first, not just all these other branches and all these other veins. If they're divisive towards the body, especially towards pastors, stop taking your burden to them. Why would you get advice from anybody? I don't want to get advice from someone. Um, I'll share a personal story um, with this. Years ago, something happened at the church that I was at before this. And there was one person, I was at the altar praying with some people, and they tried injecting in my head to be against something that our senior pastor there did, and I instantly shut them down. They may have been right. I may have been thinking the same thing. But why would I entertain that? I knew my role was to be an armor bearer or a cup bearer to, to the pastor at the time. Why am I going to entertain that? And so I encourage you that if you are seeking this advice, that you go to someone that has it in their heart to protect the foundation, to protect the temple, that is putting an effort to build the wall as well. And whatever talent or ability that you have, I'm telling you that God can use it to help build the wall around the kids. And I'm not talking about being exclusive. I'm talking about being inclusive. The church is the most exclusive, inclusive organism on the planet. <laughs> At times you're going to feel like that you're just on the outskirts, and other times you're going to be doing things with your hands, and you're going to be getting dirty, and you're going to be working. But I'm telling you, if you go to this place, and you walk up in someone's situation, and they're in this rubble, i got to pick this up next week. I can't finish this here. But if you're walking up to someone, and you know that their life is contradictive, and you know that they're broken, and they're just trying to make sense of things. We know someone, this is where this, this thing, uh, this agenda has gone. Someone that we love has gotten surgery. Rem they're, they're to a place where they are deforming their own bodies. And I told Becky, we got to pray for these people, man. We can't just talk about it. What good does this do if we're just bouncing each other? We're going to start bouncing off frustrations, you know, and it's not going to do any good. We've got to bring it to the Lord. But that's where this culture is going. This culture is going to this place where they think that they don't, they don't know who they are. And a lot of times people don't know who they are because they forgot who God is. That he made them specifically in the womb and loves them. Our role at times is going to be hard. Because you're going to be sitting down and you're going to say, I know you're trying to make sense of this, but this piece connects over here. Brian, will you come up, please? As he plays, I'm going to read through Nehemiah 4 one more time. That's where I begin. So now that you kind of know where Nehemiah is at when he walks up and he's got this burden, he heard, he responded. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? And you might say, no, I'm not going to finish in a day. But I'm not doing anything that God had not directed my heart to do. I'm not responding in a way that, or reacting in a way that is aside from what scripture has pointed my heart to do. He says, will they finish in a day? And you say, no, it's going to take time. It's going to be a process. It's going to hurt. You're going to come under threat at times. There's going to be times where you might need a weapon on your side or someone standing to your right or to your left bearing this burden with you. But it's going to be good in the end. Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices, finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? When the seed of salvation is planted in broken ground, restoration begins. Amen? So I'm going to challenge you today that in your life, if you see an area where you are trying to restore something, like I said, whether it's confidence, belief, whether it's a relationship with someone, that you take, the, you take a moment right now to say, Lord, 
do I need to bring it to the altar first? Do I need to come before you to a place of my ending so I can pursue a new beginning? And to recognize that God is at work within this. He's going to position people around you to help you build. Go to those that are going to encourage you. Will you stand?